Hello, welcome. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on intentional inclusion for people with disabilities. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you're unable to see them or having any other technical difficulties today, please email us for tech support at milfamln at gmail.com. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and for questions. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please do be sure to select the all panelists and attendees response option. This ensures everyone's able to view those comments and questions as they come through in the chat pod. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research into each other through innovative online programming. I'm now going to turn things over to my colleague, Rachel Browner, who's the program coordinator with the MFLN Military Caregiving Team to introduce today's presenter. Rachel. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. It looks like we have a great group of folks on today from all over. And um, thanks for joining us, even those that are in Germany right now that are logging on. So we appreciate it. Just a couple of things, as Coral mentioned, to reiterate, um, please let us know where you're from, um, what program you're with, maybe if there's more than one of you in your office right now joining us. Um, we're excited to be able to have Deb Daggett on today, and I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Daggett in here in a few minutes. Um, but just a few housekeeping items. You know, we're a pretty chatty group on here, so if you have any questions or comments, um, please utilize that chat pod. And for those of you that are watching from YouTube Live as well, if you go ahead and type in that chat pod, we're going to make sure that we try and get any questions or comments over into the Zoom platform as well. Also, um, we are starting off the year with our closed caption option for this morning. So if you would like to turn on your closed captioning, feel free to do so um, as we have a captioner um, logging on and um, typing as well. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and um, introduce Deborah Daggett this morning for everyone. We're excited. Deb joined um, Merrick as their chief operating or chief diversity officer, excuse me, officer in June 2001. She's had the responsibility for global equal opportunity, employee relations, recruiting and staffing and diversity and inclusion. And she's now transitioning to lead Deb Daggett Diversity Consulting. With over 80,000 employees and operating in over 100 countries, workforce diversity is no small matter at Merrick. Under Ms. Daggett's leadership at Merrick, organizations such as Diversity Inc., Working Mother, the Families and Work Institute, the Department of Defense's 2011 Freedom Award, the 20 2005 Department of Labor New Freedom Award for People with Disabilities and the Human Rights Campaign have recognized the company for its exemplary work in diversity and inclusion. Um, Deb has served for seven years on the board of the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network and was the co-chair in 2009 to 2011. She's also served on the Business Advisory Council for Catalyst and continues to serve on the Corporate Advisory Team for the Tanbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. She's currently the vice chair of the board for the U.S. Business Leadership Network and serves as a board member of the Families and Work Institute. She's the author of The Promise of Diversity, Reflections on the no Not So Level Playing Field and An Employer's Guide to Hiring and Accommodating People with Disabilities. And given her own visible disability, Deb's insights are drawn from both her personal experience and professional achievements. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and pass over the presenter reins to Deborah Daggett. Thank you very much, Rachel. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you um, on this ausp auspicious day in our country. Um, so uh, that was a very kind um, intro. And just to elaborate on 
what I bring to the conversation today in terms of my point of view. Um, as Rachel stated, I am a person with both visible and non-apparent disability. So if we were together in person, you're probably wondering um, in that picture on the front of the magazine, where I was sitting, it looked um, uh, perhaps something made you curious. Um, I was sitting on um, a scooter um, or a motorized vehicle to get around because uh, when I was at Merck, which is where that photo was taken from 2001 to the end of 2012, um, I used the scooter to get around what was a very large building. Um, I also am a person um, with non-apparent um, disabilities besides having mobility and being short statured. Um, I have uh, PTSD um, due to all the medical interventions that I've had, about 70 fractures and 45 major surgeries. Um, and I um, uh, have hearing loss, I wear hearing aids. I tell you that because that informs um, what I'm gonna share with you today. And I will use other aspects of my lived experience, including the fact that all the other members of my family, including my three children who were adopted have various types of disabilities. So um, I am clicking, there we go. So let's start out with uh, some uh, definitions. We all have probably heard about diversity and inclusion in different contexts where we may have worked, whether it was a government agency or um, through the private sector or a nonprofit. But for today's presentations, I wanted to share with you the definitions that I have used through much of my career. Um, and diversity is inclusive of both the organizational and human characteristics, experiences, needs, and traditions. And inclusion is simply providing in any given setting a sense of belonging to all the members of an organization so that they feel welcomed, respected, and valued. And that is towards being able to contribute at the highest level of their individual and or team capability. And when we're managing diversity, it's when we as leaders, whether that's through our place on an org chart or as individuals uh, influencing um, colleagues, uh, give the best effort um, from the diverse mix of people in order to achieve the goals or the mission of the organization. I have had the honor and the privilege of working with many military leaders. I served on the Families and Work Institute board with Deborah and Mike Mullen from the Joint Chiefs and did some work for the Marine Corps at Quantico um, when I first became a consultant in 2013 for a couple of years. So I'm really honored to be doing something in service of those who have served our country, as many of you um, represent the, the needs of those families. So here's another way to think about the dimensions of diversity. Um, in the center, you see what are often referred to as the primary characteristics of a person's diversity. And these are things that um, most individuals uh, see as something that um, we're not able um, to change, that they are uh, who we are. And then in the outer circle are the choices we make throughout our life but that also play um, a really important impact on how we view the world. And as you'll see, uh, military experience is included. So there, um, in terms of the numbers, uh, there is um, about 20% of the population or one in five Americans, according to the census, representing the third largest market segment and one out of three families has at least one member with a disability. Um, and this represents about a trillion dollar market segment. Now it's important to note that according to the Centers for Disease Control, the number is 25% of the US population. And amongst the younger generations, um, millennials, um, about 93% of um, the population in that uh, generation 
um, has a loved one with a disability that may be a parent or grandparent, a sibling, et cetera. So um, this is um, one way to put it is a majority minority. Globally, we believe there's about a billion individuals with disabilities, about 15% of the world population. And this is according to the United Nations. And this represents about 8 trillion in annual disposable income. Now it's important to note that every country in the world defines disability differently. And due to stigma being significantly higher in a lot of other countries, um, this number is lower um, because of those two things. What all is encompassed in a as a disability, the Americans with Disabilities Act defines it more broadly, and also um, whether or not people are willing uh, to declare. So um, in this image, you see um, a, no a number of individuals, um, there are 18, um, and you probably recognize many of them readily. I'd like you to put in the chat box of the 18, how many do you think are people who identified as living with a disability? So go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, we have the uh, former CEO of Apple, President Abraham Lincoln, Temple Grandin, and I see people are putting uh, quite a few different numbers. We have 18, 16, 7, 3, 6, 9, lots of different, yeah, some people said all of them, some said four. Um, so we're seeing um, a lot of different um, guesses as to how many it is. Well, for those of you who said um, all 18, uh, you are correct, um, as you might expect uh, during an exercise like today, um, we are trying to make an important point. And while only three of these individuals have a visible disability um, due to something that um, you could see, for instance, uh, if they use a wheelchair, uh, as the case of President Roosevelt or um, uh, Dr. Hawking, but many of these people have non-apparent disabilities and many of those are mental health related. So quickly, because people always get upset with me if I don't tell you what all their disabilities are, if I skip someone, but not to use up too much time. Steve Jobs um, has uh, passed away from pancreatic cancer. And whether you have cancer currently or a cancer survivor, that is covered under the ADA. President Lincoln was well known to have um, depression, which at the time was called melancholia and also a skeletal dysplasia called Marfan syndrome, which why he had an unusual appearance. Temple Grandin, who revolutionized the beef industry and made it more humane, is on the autism spectrum. And many people on the spectrum prefer to be called neurodiverse, as does she. Um, uh, and people who are not on the spectrum are often called neuro typical by those who do identify as neurodiverse. Uh, Max Domi um, has type 1 diabetes, which was diagnosed when he was 12. Jane Polly, a uh, bipolar condition. President Roosevelt was diagnosed with poliomyelitis myelitis at the time, but uh, it's now thought that he had something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune condition. Um, any kind of autoimmune condition is also covered under the ADA, like sickle cell, uh, silver syndrome, et cetera. Brett Michaels, um, a rocker for a band called Poison, also had type 1 diabetes and experienced a significant stroke. Walter Payton had cancer, and although it wasn't known at the time, concussion syndrome. Uh, that was a condition that was created after he passed away. Catherine Zeta-Jones, bipolar condition, uh, Dr. Hawking, um, Lou Gehrig's or uh, ALS, Ashley Judd, Bruce Springsteen, Mike Wallace, and Janet Jackson all publicly discussed how they dealt with depression. 
But Aldrin also experienced depression and self-medicated up until he went into recovery with alcohol. And yes, people in recovery from substance use are covered under the ADA, even um, like uh, Buzz Aldrin, even if it's been a long time uh, that they have been in recovery. James Earl Jones is an interesting one. When he uh, was a young person, he had a very, very severe stutter. And um, so often when we think of someone and what they're going to be good at in their profession, we try to say, well, this would be good for someone with that disability. But as is evidenced by James Earl Jones, he was really good at using his voice despite the stutter. And um, so we never want to presuppose. Tom Cruise, who has dyslexia and describes himself as functionally illiterate, is another good example of not prejudging what someone is capable of, given the many scripts that um, he used um, auditory ways of reviewing and memorizing. So in the US, the definition is a physical or mental condition that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And it's important to note that 75% of disabilities, as was evident in the exercise that we just went through, are non-apparent. Notice I'm not saying hidden or invisible because depending on the situation that the person is, oftentimes their disability does become visible, such as a person with ADHD, as my middle daughter has, trying to work in an open office or noisy, high distraction environment where it's difficult for them to concentrate. Or if someone has diabetes and their blood sugar is low, or they have an anxiety condition and they're asked to give um, a public presentation in front of executives. Um, or there is a, a, a drill or emergency evacuation of a building which can trigger um, disability challenges in almost all of the conditions that are noted in this chart um, that I won't read to you. Um, so uh, finally, I would just say, um, as was noted again in the exercise, uh, it covers anyone who has a record of or is regarded as having a disability. So um, I worked with someone whose hands were shaped differently. She did not need any form of an accommodation, but she was widely regarded as having a disability. That may also be true for someone with a birthmark or burn scars, even if they do not need any form of an accommodation. Um, as Rachel said throughout today's presentation, if you have any questions at all, do not hesitate to put them into the chat. We'll either answer them as we go or at the end of today's presentation. I want to acknowledge that many times when people see this slide, uh, they're a bit surprised either because they or a loved one is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is not because we're trying to label people but simply that we recognize that individuals with this broad range of conditions could have the potential to experience discrimination or stigma that could be career limiting or cause them to have difficulty obtaining or keeping employment. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about language. Um, the preferred language is called people first rather than putting um, their disability first. So a person with quadriplegia, not a quadriplegic, um, or a person with diabetes, not diabetic. We no longer use outdated terms like retarded, um, which is considered to be a highly negative, or handicapped, which comes from panhandling or holding one's cap in their hand. We also don't use terms like confined to or suffers from. Um, it's a person who uses a wheelchair. A, a wheelchair is a tool that enables somebody to get around. It is liberating, not confining. And um, people are not bound in their wheelchair. Even if they choose to wear a seatbelt, uh, they can easily take it off. 
Um, and uh, we also avoid anything that overly medicalizes the condition like victim or suffering. Um, when you're setting up an interview or planning an event, you want to make sure you ask everyone if they need some form of an accommodation. And uh, we've offered some sample language that you can take away with today's presentation. We are committed to creating a welcoming and accessible environment. If you need a disability accommodation, please let us know. I recommend you do this with every candidate for every event. Again, I can't drive home enough the fact that 75% of disabilities are not uh, non-apparent. Um, and according to a study done by the Center for Talent Innovation three years ago, a very respected HR research organization, 30% of office-based college educated workers identify as living with a disability, so nearly a third. So you may think as you look around an environment that we don't have people with disabilities, um, but in fact, it's likely um, to be anywhere from 20 to 30%. And of course, you wanna make sure locations for interviews are accessible, and that includes the parking, the egress into the building, the location of the interviews and the restrooms. And also remember if they're gonna be expected to get um, a meal in your cafeteria, that it is also accessible. We wanna avoid labeling. Um, we don't use the term normal as it has no real meaning since we're all different. Um, you uh, wanna treat adults in a manner befitting adults. So what do we mean by that? Well, I can tell you as someone who's short statured when I was walking with a cane or using a wheelchair, often people would talk to me as if I were a child or talk to uh, somebody who was with me that appeared to be a person who identifies as able-bodied. You wanna call a person by their first name only when you extend that familiarity to all others. So if a person has their doctorate, whether it's an MD or a PhD, you use that honorific. And um, like with teachers or people who are older, if you use Mr. or Mrs. or Ms., again, you wanna uh, 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 extend that same courtesy to someone with a disability. You're probably asking yourself, why is that the case? Well, often people with disabilities do not receive that same kind of respect. So we'd like to point that out. You wanna always speak directly to the person with a disability, not to a sign language an interpreter or companion. In fact, if they have an interpreter, I would suggest you position that person alongside you so that you're looking directly at the person who is relying on the interpreting. It's easier for them to see the signs and it's less distracting for you. And you should not assume that if someone has a companion with them, uh, that that person um, speaks for them. You wanna relax and make eye contact. Um, so often as young children, we're told not to stare at someone who looks different, whether that's due to a disability or some other form of difference. Um, but it, making eye contact is important. That's how we connect with each other. And I would add smiling. Um, well, that's not true in every country here in the US. Uh, normally when we wanna set someone at ease, we smile. And oh, by the way, this includes when you're talking with someone who is blind or has low vision. They can tell the difference as to whether or not you are looking at them. And do not be embarrassed to use common expressions like, see you later, or did you hear that we're going to be moving our office, or I'll be running along now. Uh, people who um, have disabilities use these same common expressions and are not offended by them. Um, it's always important to ask someone before the before you uh, assist them in some way. You don't want to assume they need help. And if they do want your assistance, ask how before you act. Um, as a wheelchair user, I do use a push chair most of the time when I travel. I have had people come up behind me and push the chair. It is remarkably easy to tip a wheelchair over, especially outdoors. So it's important to take the person's guidance. 
Um, also, if someone is trying to open a door and they're leaning on it, if you grab the door and open it before they um, take their arm off, they, you know, they can fall down because they're leaning on it for balance. And there's any number of other situations where it can actually be unsafe to assist someone without asking about the most effective and safe way to do that. If someone uh, who you offer assistance to says, no, thank you, or I've got this, or in other ways, let you know that they're uh, more comfortable doing something themselves, do not think that you did anything wrong or were not well received, nor should you think that they should have accepted your assistance. It should be seen as a positive exchange, whether they wanted assistance or not. People with disabilities, even if they're doing something that looks really awkward, are the best judge of what works best for them. And if someone on your team um, requests an accommodation or a colleague, it's not a complaint or a favor. It just is an opportunity to find out more details. Um, so now we're going to talk about some specific types of disabilities, starting with developmental disabilities. This is an umbrella term that includes both conditions that are apparent during uh, childhood, um, and often we use it for people with an intellectual disability. Technically, it can also apply to someone like me. I was born with my condition, as are uh, people with cerebral palsy, spina bifida. Um, and uh, normally, we use developmental to refer to intellectual disabilities. But from a medical sense, um, it's broader than that. If you are talking to someone who identifies as having an intellectual disability, you should not assume. You want to break things down into their basic components. Um, it can be harder for someone who has this type of condition to learn quickly or simultaneously learn multiple things. So you want to give the person an opportunity to grasp each individual step before going on to the next one. And um, yeah, please do go ahead and put questions in the chat if you have any. Um, we have a, a lot of material, but we have plenty of time to deal with the Q&A as well. Um, people with mobility conditions. If you're talking to someone who uses a wheelchair or is short statured, the term we use for short statured for people who belong to Little People of America is also little person or LP, but that's only if they identify uh, with um, membership in that organization. Uh, but if you hear people call themselves an LP, that's probably why. Um, if you um, are trying to get down to their eye level, the best thing to do if it's available is to sit in a chair um, and have them go over near where you're able to sit. If there are no chairs available, like at a cocktail reception or some type of other event where chairs were not provided, see if there is a wall or pillar nearby, lean against it, and then slide down a little. It's a lot easier on your knees, and then it doesn't look like you're talking to a small child. Never grab the back of someone's wheelchair. It feels actually like you're grabbing them. Um, you can feel whenever someone touches your wheelchair or other assistive device. Um, leaning on their wheelchair is like leaning on them and it's considered annoying unless you're a loved one and you've been given permission. Obviously my children and my husband not only get to lean on my wheelchair, but they also like to hang stuff off of it so they don't have to carry it. Um, but that's something if you have a close personal relationship. If someone has um, a mobility aid and you think it's a safety hazard because it's in an aisle or someone might trip, ask the person to move it themselves or where you would like them to put it if that would be easier for them. Uh, they probably will want it where they can reach it, not off in the corner. Um, if they're attending a meeting or an interview, again, you want to make sure the parking, the front door, um, the egress, um, and the restrooms are all accessible. 
for people who are blind or have low vision, and by the way, low vision is the um, appreciated terminology versus um, visually impaired. We try to stay away from impairment. Uh, we use um, low vision. Um, so when meeting a person who is blind, you of course want to identify yourself um, and um, you know where you may, may have met them before and introduce others that are um, also in uh, the same general area. When offering assistance, um, you want to ask, and if they do re request their help, guide rather than propel them and give clear instructions you know, a step up or a step down, not just a step, if it's extra tall, if it's very shallow, if there's something low hanging where they might bump their head, if you're going into an elevator or a narrow area. When you offer a seat, you wanna place the person's hand on the back of the chair um, and give them, um, or the arm of the chair would be all right as well. And let them know kind of the layout of the room. Like uh, there is a long conference table. There are five chairs on either side, uh, one on each end, and there's a window on one side of the room. Where would you prefer to be seated? Um, leave doors either fully open or closed so that the person does not bump into them and, and uh, receive a severe injury. Uh, do not leave someone talking to an empty space. Um, if you have to get up and leave the room for a minute or leave the meeting, uh, let them know that you're going to be departing. And if you're going to go get food or a beverage, maybe offer to bring them something. If there's a buffet setting, you want to let them know what's there um, and um, offer to help them get the food if that would be helpful. Uh, when you're describing where food is located on a, on a plate, you can use the hands of the clock. Uh, for instance, um, the egg rolls are at noon and the rice is at 6 p.m. If you're welcoming a person who's blind to a room, it, like I said, you want to give them the geography. Okay, people who are blind or hard of hearing. Again, hard of hearing is appreciated over um, hearing impaired. So um, if you're a person who's deaf and the telephone rings or someone knocks on the door, um, I'm sorry if you are with someone who's deaf, um, excuse yourself and let the person know why you're needing um, to respond to something, a sidebar conversation, etc. And this includes, of course, virtual um, Zoom meetings. Um, in group conversation, um, let the person know what the topic is in advance, preferably. Also with people who um, have uh, various disabilities, it's extremely helpful to provide an agenda in advance and any presentations that are going to be given so that they can prepare. You want to um, you leverage technology like texting, email, and captioning to facilitate communication. Hearing aids like the ones I wear amplify all sound. So you want to keep excess noise to a minimum. And you really don't want to try to get to know someone in a noisy bar or try to conduct an interview or important conversation in a noisy restaurant, which can make it extremely hard. Often this is also a private conversation. So you don't want to have to talk loudly in order for the person with the hearing um, disability to be able to hear you over the background noise. So just not a good idea. Um, speak directly to the person, not their interpreter, as we said before. And um, if you are talking with someone who tells you that they are able to lip read, look directly at the person and speak slowly and clearly. Do not speak super slowly and do not over enunciate because that just distorts it and they can't understand what you're saying. Um, you don't wanna talk super fast, but um, generally in a normal tone of voice, avoid gum chewing, covering your mouth, and remember that sign language relies heavily on facial expressions, gestures, and body movements, which emphasize um, the words you use. 
about only three out of 10 words are visible on the lips. And that's what you see when people are using sign language that they're very animated. 80% of human com communication is nonverbal. So do use uh, that kind of communication in addition to saying the words if someone is a lip reader. Uh, people who have a mental illness, as I said before, one in four Americans or about a quarter of the population has some type of a mental health condition and treatment for the most common conditions is effective 80% of the time. But unfortunately, due to stigma, only about a third of the people who need help will get it. Um, and this is a lot of this is fear to shame and repercussions at work. And the best way to avoid this um, is to learn and share the facts about mental health conditions. Thankfully, one of the silver linings of COVID-19 has been raising awareness around mental wellness and getting uh, more help to people who need it. Remember that every person is unique. So if you know one person who has depression or bipolar or another condition, you know one person. Um, don't think that you now know what to say or do um, or what would be helpful. You need to treat each person as an individual. And as with people with any disability, you wanna continue uh, to set clear job and performance expectations. If someone appears to be in crisis, um, it, it's important to stay calm and be supportive. Um, your calm voice and caring, empathetic manner, asking how you can help will help them to calm down, catch their breath and be able to share with you what would be helpful. So along those lines, what do you say to someone who you think may be experiencing a mental health crisis? Um, here are some examples. You don't seem like yourself. Do you want to talk about it? Are you comfortable talking about it? If not with me, is there someone else you can talk to? How can we support you? It seems like you're going through a tough time. Is there something we could do to help? I'm worried about you. Can we talk about what's going on? Do you know where you can go for help? If you both work for the same organization, you're going to want to um, refer them to the resources. Um, are you thinking about harming yourself? It is okay to ask. You won't put the idea in someone's head and actually asking them if they have a plan to harm themselves is the first step to prevention. I so, had a few questions or comments that came through and I don't know if you want to get to them now or wait. Um, uh, that would be fine. Go ahead. Okay, so we had a comment from a YouTube live individual. Not everyone has been trained in special education or trained in the newest terms for disabilities. I think the best thing is to educate people kindly. Just treat people how you want to be treated. Thank you for that comment. It's really, really uh, helpful and important. Um, and you're right. Um, in the academic setting, especially if through K through 12, we often use the term special education. Please know that um, that term is often not appreciated by students with disabilities themselves, although it's one often used by educators and parents. Um, for a child, whether it's a baby boomer like me or my 20-somethings uh, who all have disabilities, the connotation is um, less than or that they can't fully participate or they're not as smart. Um, so we do want to refer to individualized education plans or IEPs or accommodations in the school environment or school adjustments. Um, when it comes to the golden rule or treating others as you would want to be treated, for all dimensions of diversity, um, the golden rule is a good place to start, but it unfortunately doesn't go far enough. We really need to um, use what is called the platinum rule, and that is treat others as they want to be treated. But the challenge is that requires that you ask. 
So just like we've been talking about what would be helpful to someone who might need assistance, um, we also would ask someone how to pronounce their name or if they have any dietary restrictions um, or any number of other things in a diverse society where our experience of growing up may be different from others. Is there any other questions before we move to this next slide? We do have a few more. Okay. So can you provide a resource for ensuring that websites are accessible? Yes, there are um, many uh, resources that I can provide. And what I would like to do, if that's OK, um, is to send those to the host for today's meeting who can make it available on your website, because those are links uh, that don't lend themselves to me verbally stating them. But there are some excellent resources for making websites accessible, um, as well as anything that is micro in Microsoft, PowerPoint, Excel, Word. There is under the review tab, a check accessibility feature that will walk you through how to make documents accessible. PDFs are very difficult to make accessible, so it's best not to use them when you are giving a document to someone with a, vi a visual disability. Thank you. And any um, resources that we're going to be discussing today or those that Deb adds to the list, we will post them on the event page and that link is posted throughout the chat pod, but also on your PowerPoint slides as well. And then we just have one final comment from Kathy um, that just mentioned when you were talking about um, suicides or mental health. Um, Kathy mentioned there are wonderful trainings such as Safe Talk and Assist to help people thinking about suicide. That's a great point. And today's presentation is not meant to either encourage you to think of yourself if, if you're not a trained mental health professional as a pseudo one, I know you're not thinking that, but I, I just want to reinforce that. It says a colleague and healthcare provider, just to give you some tips, because so often in the moment you might get caught off guard and, and this is um, some helpful reminders um, so that you're there for a loved one, a colleague, a patient, um, that um, you're, you're thinking about what to say. Um, and especially in a military environment, military culture is one of not necessarily wanting to talk about any kind of weakness, including disability. And so some of the, these things about what not to say um, may be more consistent with military culture while people are serving. Um, so just shake it off or everyone feels that way sometimes. Um, for those who are raised to have you know a strong warrior mentality it can be really hard to um, own feeling vulnerable and yet we still want people to feel safe with us if they are in need of help or struggling um, one of those can be just pray about it for those of us for whom faith is an important part of our lives. And while prayer can be a source of strength and, and comfort people, it's not a replacement for getting a, the needed treatment. Um, we wouldn't say that about getting insulin shots if someone was insulin dependent with diabetes. And we shouldn't say that about someone who needs um, some form of treatment for a mental health condition. Also, something like you should just fill in, you know, and that like meditate or run a couple miles or whatever, um, or you have the same, you know, condition as someone I know, or why are you acting weird? Um, one of the things that was interesting for me when I served inside of a corporation is imagine the reason I'm small is I have brittle bones. And so it's, it's a bit perplexing, but every major corporation I ever worked for, and there were five of them, always put me in charge of preventing violence in the workplace. It may be also because I have a master's degree in clinical psychology, but one of the things that happens is when someone starts demonstrating that they have a mental health crisis, nine times out of 10, the people around them get scared that they may be violent and that they may harm others. The data shows us that people with mental health conditions are most likely to harm themselves 
but no more likely than someone without a mental con health condition to harm others. Unfortunately, in the media too often, if a violent act occurs before anyone has um, officially diagnosed it, they had a mental health condition, there is conjecture to that point that is never corrected. So we have a false narrative in our society about people being violent. The worst thing you can do is nothing. It may feel awkward to start the conversation um, and that's important. I wanna acknowledge um, there is a stigma. Uh, uh, thank you, Tamara. Um, there is a stigma associated with PTSD, especially for those who have served in the military, um, that they will be violent. But even people who work for the postal service, we say silly things like going postal. Um, it is just as likely to have PTS when, and, and often people uh, prefer that you remove the D disorder to post-traumatic stress. Um, if you are a civilian and have not served our country in the military. And um, violence is not a normative part of that. It can be um, an, a, something that happens with a trigger. But again, um, it's, all, it, it's overly attributed to people who are dealing with um, certain triggers uh, like loud noises or other things associated with their service. Ableism is the practice and dominant attitudes that devalue and limit the potential of persons with disabilities. So yes, that is a thing. There is an ism, ableism. It's, it can also be a set of practices and beliefs that say that someone's less valuable um, if they have some type of a disability. In fact, um, the word disability in Spanish is translated in, into either not valued or less valued. Discrimination in favor of somebody who does not identify as living with a disability um, is also a feature. And believing that um, a person with a disability has to be fixed, um, that they have a deficiency, and that it's inherently to uh, a negative thing to be a person with a disability. When I go to Little People of America conferences, um, where there is upwards of 2,000 people, um, we refer to people who are tall as average size. And we're happy if we um, either have a biological or um, adopted child who's also going to be short stature. People in the deaf community also see sign language and deaf culture. And if you see the D capitalized, it means it's culture as superior to hearing and spoken culture. So we shouldn't assume that people think of their disability as necessarily negative or that it needs to be fixed or that even that a healthcare professional is the right person to advise them on how um, and what type of an accommodation will work best in the work environment. While that may be required by an attorney or human resources, to have documentation of a disability, it is relatively rare that a doctor knows what accommodation would work for someone at work since they don't know what the person does and um, the person knows what works best for them. So let's talk about the intersection of disability and other dimensions of diversity. It's important to note that women are the most often the primary caregivers for family members with a disability. And that includes women like myself who have a disability themselves, are caring for an elder family mother, my 83-year-old mother with a disability lives in our home, and my, both my husband and my three kids have disabilities. Um, that is not that uncommon. Women of color are more likely to be responsible for caring for a broader extended family, including grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and in-laws in the same manner as a nuclear family in the white community um, with the same level of obligation and need to take on that responsibility. It's important to note that communities of color often have a higher incidence of disability due to exposure to hazardous conditions and healthcare disparities um, in um, the healthcare community. And we don't have time to get into all of that today, but I know many of you are part of the healthcare community and this is in no way to be disparaging 
just simply stating the fact that often um, people don't get the same level of care um, and um, have greater morbidity and mortality rates. Veterans have a different definition of a disability as defined by the Veterans Administration um, and their percent rating when they're discharged from the service. And there's a cultural reluctance to identify. Homosexuality um, was defined as a mental health disability until 1973. So some people, especially baby boomers, um, who are part of the LGBTQ community may have concerns about identifying um, as living, especially with a mental health disability. Um, th these are also community members that are more likely to be caring for family members and or adopt children with disabilities for a wide range of reasons. And the ADA generation or people born after the ADA passed in 1990, that generation views disability as a normative part of the human condition and have experienced greater integration into society, through school, and um, through the accommodations that they received often without needing to request them. Um, someone asked, uh, is colorblindness covered under the ADA? It can be if it gets in the way of your job. So for instance, if you are required to be able to differentiate between colors, like in a chemist lab or in charts, um, so an accommodation may be needed in order to correctly um, evaluate information um, and read things that are required at work. So yes, it can be if um, it's needed as a part of a work environment and requires a workplace adjustment. Thank you for that question. In terms of ally or caregiver advocacy, advocacy as allies for people with all types of disabilities is very important. And it's been really heartbreaking to see families <clears throat> affected by COVID-19 whose loved ones are not able to be with them uh, due to the virus. It may be in some cases that under the ADA, you will need to allow a caregiver to be with someone, even if they have COVID-19. That is not something I can comment on, but you will want to check with your state, local, and organizational legal advice if someone invokes the ADA and having a caregiver with them. Remember that this person or family member has likely encountered many obstacles, including being put off, ignored, and they are prepared to make the most of every minute because it's so hard to get time with the healthcare professional to make sure they are heard and they get their needs met and make sure that they have the appropriate history. Um, it's avoid legalistic and medical jargon and acronyms when explaining things, use plain language. Do not be surprised if there are tears or anger, even when you enter the room before you even have a chance to say anything, because there's often a lot of pent up frustration and there's stress and pain associated with managing their disability. Don't take it personally. Become informed and do your best to use the etiquette and some of the guidance you're learning about today um, and using respectful language and interaction choices. And remember that a bad experience can feel overwhelming and like a major setback and the person may need to process that. Um, someone asked if kidney disease is covered under the ADA. Yes, it can be, um, especially if the person needs an accommodation like uh, to go through dialysis um, or um, to stay extra hydrated um, or to um, avoid certain situations. So here are some resources that we're offering. I'm going to add the ones on making websites accessible. These are some excellent resources that are all free. And uh, the last one is an etiquette guide that is quite good that also has some graphics. Um, but uh, all of these are an amazing resource. It's the Job Accommodation Network, which has a database, videos, PowerPoints, all kinds of amazing resources. So we have about seven minutes left, and um, I uh, will turn it back over to our hosts um, for both question facilitation and I believe a couple of closing slides.
Thank you. All right. So if you have any questions as we begin to close out, we have about seven minutes left. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and type them in the chat pod. Mary mentioned I'm overwhelmed with your excellent presentation. You've offered such a broad and useful review of this topic. Closed captions are helpful. Thanks for making recording and slides available to share with others. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary, for that comment. Um, and thank you, Deb, for today's presentation. It's been really eye-opening, great information. Um, I appreciate the breakdown of ADA and disabilities that are covered um, and how we can talk and think through um, communications with those with disabilities. So I really appreciate the information that you've provided. Please feel free to continue any comments or questions in the chat pod. We're going to go ahead and switch to the next slide for some final information for those of you that are interested in evaluations and continuing education credits and certificates. So this webinar is providing Social Work LPC LMFT Case Manager patient advocate, certified family life educators, um, CE credits. And then for those of you that are just interested in a general certificate of completion to provide to your supervisors or um, to have on hand for your records, we do offer certificates of completion. You'll be able to find an evaluation link, which will be a purple button on the event page that's titled Continuing Education. So please give us just a, a few minutes to get that link posted. It um, will be on the events page. And as Coral mentioned in the chat pod, this presentation is recorded. Um, give us about a day or two to get it posted to the event page. But if you or anyone um, of your colleagues that was unable to join or even some of the families that you serve um, are unable to join us, you can share the recording of this presentation in any um, copies of the PowerPoint slides and resources will all be posted on this event page. So um, please stay tuned. Thanks, Coral, for posting that in the chat pod as well. And then also, um, this is our first webinar of 2021. So I feel like we've had a really good turnout. I appreciate everyone joining us. Stay tuned, though, next month, um, our caregiving concentration area will have a session on the Military Family Readiness Academy. And so this session is going to be on going beyond the checklist and emergency preparedness. And so our session, our military caregiving session of the MFRA, which is the Military Family Readiness Academy, you know, the military likes all these acronyms. And so um, our webinar next month will be held at 11 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday, February 17th. In this particular session, caregivers can play a vital role in assisting families living with disabilities as they plan and prepare for disasters. So participants will gain the knowledge and understanding, especially regarding disability, needed to encourage families to take action now before disaster strikes. And so through an interactive session, military service providers, educators, and family caregivers will learn essential steps to help build family resilience. And so I'm going to go ahead and post a link in the chat pod if you're interested in signing up um, for next month webinar for the Military Family Readiness Academy session on caregiving. Um, please join us. Um, there's going to be several sessions coming out this spring based on the disaster and hazard readiness in action, part of that Military Family Readiness Academy, and um, all geared to disaster preparedness. And it's going to be focusing not only on caregiving, but also on family development, personal finance as it relates to emergency preparedness. And so get connected with us. And um, we have a lot of great offerings happening this spring in addition to our February 17th event. All right, so we are now close to the top of the hour. So we are gonna hang on for any last minute questions, comments, and for those of you that need to gather any links in the chat pod. Um, oh, Tanya, you asked how many were we able to reach in this presentation? So we had approximately, I would say 90 folks on Zoom and about 30, 34 folks in YouTube Live joining us today. So a good crowd. Um, 
we appreciate everyone's participation and engagement. So we'll stay on for about a minute and um, then log off. But again, Deb, thank you so much for a really good presentation for your time today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the afternoon um, and a good 2021. So I'm going to go ahead and be quiet <laughs> um, and we'll stay on for just a few more session, a few more minutes, excuse me. My pleasure, and I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes as well if um, there are additional questions. Well, Rachel, I don't see any additional questions coming through the chat, just some additional thanks and uh, appreciation for this topic. So Deb, thank you again so much for your time, expertise, and sharing of this very important topic. We appreciate you helping us kick off our webinar programming season this year. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. I'll go ahead and log off then. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. So if anyone, uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Rachel and her team at ag.tmu.edu. And I've just placed that email address in the chat for your reference. We are going to go ahead and close things out today. For today, thank you again for joining us and we will see you again soon. <laughs>